Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn Information and Support session. This is the fourth of eight noon hour webinars hosted by the Breast and Gynae Cancer Center of Hope. My name is Kathleen Helgeson and I'm the coordinator of the Patient and Family Resource Center. And I'm joined today by Lori Santoro and Michelle Alwood, breast and gynae cancer patient and family educators who will be sharing their knowledge and answering your questions about menopause. We are very pleased to offer this, this session today with the generous funding support of the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting from all regions in Manitoba, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, and Dene people, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's important for us to foster inclusivity and reconciliation and to encourage others to do the same. Before we continue, there are a few basic Zoom features that I'd like to explain. You'll notice as an attendee, your video and your audio are turned off. If you have a question at any time during the presentation for either Michelle or Lori, just click on the Q&A icon on your screen and type your question. You can also ask that question anonymously by checking the send anonymously box before you click on the blue arrow to send. My coworker Ellie is also here off screen and will be helping us manage your questions. If you have a technical concern, you can also type that question into the Q&A and Ellie will answer your question privately and try to assist you. So our presenters today are the dynamic duo behind the Breast and Gynae Cancer Center of Hope and offering personalized cancer education and support to women and their families. So welcome to both of you. And I believe that Michelle is going to start us off today on our discussion about menopause. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the introduction. I'll just bring my slideshow up here. All right. me one second. I apologize. Sorry. I apologize to everybody. So I'm Michelle, as Kathleen mentioned. I work here at the Breast and Gynae Cancer Center of Hope. And Lori and I will be doing this session interchangeably. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for attending today's session. Um, when we look at the female hormones produced by the ovaries, the main hormones are estrogen and progesterone. The, when we're looking at the types of um, functions within the body, it's commonly known that it's the main essential part of a woman's reproductive system, including regulating her menstrual cycle on a monthly basis. The other thing that female hormones can do as well too, is prepare the uterus itself for pregnancy. One important factor that we often forget about even myself as a practitioner, is that there's also testosterone that's made in small amounts of in the ovaries as well. Um, and it has function within our body as well too. When we look at the effects of estrogen on the body, as you can see by the diagram that's attached, there's several functions within the body. Um, can be to do with physical features such as a widened pelvis, um, which has to do with childbirth, et cetera. Um, also the increased amounts of body fats that women will have typically around the hip and the buttocks kind of area, as well as the less facial hair. As many of us age, we start noticing hair thickening, that kind of thing. And we'll talk a bit about um, perimenopause and things like that as the, the session progresses. Um, women in general have a smoother skin overall, um, but lots of really great benefits to estrogen um, from the time of puberty onwards to perimenopause and menopause. As I mentioned, yeah. Perry. Oh, Michelle, sorry, I, I, I did just have a question before you, you moved on. When you were talking about testosterone and the other hormones, which hormones are, because we just had our session last week on sexuality, which hormones are primarily responsible for libido? Are they, are mm -hmm. all, or is it the female hormones or the testosterone we think of as, as a male hormone? Mm -hmm. So when we look at libido, as the session mentioned last week, it's more to do in women with brain and brain function um, than anything. When we look at libido, often they will try things like testosterone and things like that in smaller dosages for people to try and increase libido for women. Studies actually don't strongly support that as something that's effective for it, but sometimes menopause specialists will try it as one of the tools, so to speak, in the toolbox um, overall. Okay, thanks. Sure. 
um, when we look at perimenopause, um, perimenopause is this time before the actual induction to menopause. So it lasts approximately about 10 years. Most women, it starts kind of late 30s, early 40s. Um, it's this waxing and waning of hormones. Um, it's when people often will start with hot flashes, sleep disturbance, other effects on the body to do with this hormone dysregulation. Periods often become irregular during this time. For some people, their periods may get a lot heavier than what they've been in the past. We're considered to be in menopause when you've went a full year without a period. In the breast cancer world, they also look at supporting blood work. That's partially in due to the fact of the treatments that they have as well too. When we look at things from a gynecological perspective, it depends on the type of gyne surgery you've had, the gyne treatment, et cetera. And we'll go into that in more detail in future um, talks during this session as well. If menopause happens earlier than the age of 40, it's actually considered to be a premature menopause. And premature menopause ha affects or uh, involves about 1% of the female population as well. When we look at treatment-induced menopause, it's very different than natural menopause. Um, when we look at treatment-induced menopause, it's usually much more abrupt. We don't usually have that 10-year span of waxing and waning of hormones. And so when we've kind of lost that ability to gradually get our body into the menopause mode, often the symptoms are much more significant for people that have this brought on by treatment. When we're looking at the types of treatment, we know surgery. So surgical removal of the ovaries can cause menopause. People can have their uterus removed, but their ovaries left in place and still have the hormones, even though they're not getting a period. So you're not considered menopausal if your ovaries are left in place and functioning. When we look at treatments like pelvic radiation, we know that those also, so to speak, cause premature menopause. And things in the breast cancer world of chemotherapies, as well as some of their anti-hormone treatments. Michelle, is it normal for women to have um, hormonal supplements following treatment or during menopause? So that's a good question. So part of that conversation is in conversation with your doctor, because it depends if you have a hormone-reliant cancer. In the breast cancer world, they don't put people on hormones. All right, there's an exception if people it's greatly affecting their quality of life. All right. When we look at the gyne cancer world, if we put people into menopause early because of the type of treatment they've had, then we will have conversation with them because from our perspective, it's more so the rule that we put people on a hormone replacement therapy up to the natural age of menopause. All right. When we look at um, people in the breast cancer world, so to speak, those women, the younger women tend to have their periods come back after um, they're done their treatment, all right? When we're looking at um, people that are heading into that natural age of menopause anyways, and again, that's around that age 52, um, those women are less likely to have their periods return. It's really important to realize though, if you're a younger woman and you still have your ovaries, uterus, et cetera, in place, you may still become pregnant if you've been treated for breast cancer, even though your periods haven't returned. So having a reliable form of birth control like condoms is really important. All right, and if you want more conversation, Lori's available for that at any point in time too. Um, when it comes to women who've been treated for gynecological cancer, these women um, will sometimes have their periods, et cetera, returned. There's a specific subtype of ovarian cancer, which is called a germ cell tumor. And those specific ovarian cancers can sometimes have one ovary tube and uterus left in place to preserve fertility. Generally speaking, with most gyne cancers, the ovaries are removed, thus losing fertility, or with pelvic radiation. Um, so those women do not have their ovarian function return. And this is a generality. Of course, there's some people that have don't fit this exact profile. And that's where they're welcome to talk to me a bit more and have some more conversation as well. 
Oh, thank you, Michelle. So I think that we're going to switch over to Lori is going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, symptoms of menopause. But before we do that, let's just take a moment right now to pull our audience. So we're going to just check in with you in terms of uh, what type of symptoms of menopause you've experienced. So I'm sending a poll to your screen. And um, you can uh, check any of these responses that are applicable for you that re that you relate to. And uh, then when we finish polling, I'll share the results. If you're not seeing a poll come up on your screen, it just may be that your computer doesn't support that. Um, you can also type your um, response in the Q&A and Ellie will relay it to us. Okay, we have just over half of you having voted. So I'll just give it um, another moment or so and then I'll share the results with you. Thank you, Kathleen. It's very common for women to first reach out to Lori and I during the period of survivorship with some menopause management issues. Um, so don't hesitate in reaching out. So I'm just sharing the results now. Can uh, Lori and Michelle, can you see those results? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to comment on them? When looking at the results, I myself am not surprised. Hot flashes tend to be the most common um, menopausal symptom. And when we're looking at things like fatigue and night sweats, that kind of thing, that is also um, looking at perimenopause, one of the counter kind of things or hallmark things of perimenopause. Um, any comments you'd like to share, Lori? No, I agree. Um, and often there's that domino effect, right? Mm -hmm. If you're disrupting your sleep, then you've got the brain fog, the fatigue, mm -hmm. the emotions as well. So they're all um, right on par where I thought they would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm just going to um, stop sharing that screen. We do have a question um, from one of our audience members, if I can just sure. um, go to that right now. So um, just a question, I guess, with respect to um, Michelle's presentation about asking af after radiation is they're still experiencing a lot of pink blood and it's still going on. Is that a concern that they should be, be talking to their doctor about? So my assumption is that someone's referring to pelvic radiation. Um, the first three months after um, radiation, you can get still an ongoing vaginal discharge, which can be the tumor necrosis in relation to a cervical cancer treatment. But if you're having any abnormal bleeding, et cetera, even discharge like that, it's always best to phone your practitioners here at Cancer Care or contact me directly. Um, my number is in the email that was sent out with today's link. Um, absolutely reach out and we can kind of sort through what might be normal for you and when it's important or appropriate to call us. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And Lori, perhaps you could um, answer this one because you're going to be talking about some of the symptoms right away. Is water retention uh, a symptom of menopause? Um, some people find that they do get a little bit puffy. It could be related to the treatments that they've had. Um, sometimes um, when you're wrapping up your treatment, you may find that you're um, so fatigued that you're a little bit less active. So there's multiple things that could be contributing to it. And I would suggest that um, always, you know, just reviewing those symptoms with your team. Good. I love this first slide that you have here. It's great. <laughs> it's my favorite. And I, I've used it for many years because it speaks volumes. <laughs> Um, you know, menopause is a, a tricky thing and uh, I feel bad for our families sometimes when uh, they're dealing with us, but we know that, um, you know, it depends on which way the wind is blowing and where the moon is in the sky as to how we're tolerating and managing um, menopausal symptoms. And, you know, some women start having symptoms early. Um, during the last maybe 10 years or so of having periods. Uh, some people will continue for a few years after they finish having periods. 
I met one lady in her 80s that told me she still had hot flashes. So I, I sure hope not. <laughs> so I'll get you to change the slide there, Michelle. So we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the side effects and um, managing menopause. And I love this. Um, you know, you got to go with the flow and you've got to uh, find what works for you in managing your symptoms. Hot. Oh, go back. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of those uh, symptoms. So hot flashes. I have a lot of people um, that talk about, um, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with me. I'm feeling something very different than I've had before. Um, and typically hot flashes might be this sudden kind of surge of heat centered on your chest and kind of up into your neck and your chest. Um, and it just kind of becomes very quick. Sometimes they can last for two to four minutes and then they kind of slowly subside. Some ladies might be uh, perspiring. Uh, some ladies may find that they have palpitations where they feel like their heart rate is kind of beeping, beating and pumping a little more intense than it had been. Um, then obviously the chills and the shivering as things are starting to cool down. And some ladies do experience a sensation of anxiety and it can be really significant for um, managing some of that, uh, the side effects, because now you're also dealing with that sense of uh, stress. Um, sometimes women might have a couple throughout the day. Some ladies are having more significant hot flashes where it may be, you know, every hour they're, they're flashing. Um, and certainly that can continue on into the night, which can make a huge, huge um, ripple effect. 80% um, of women have hot flashes in varying degrees, and only 20 to 30% of women would um, seek medical attention for assisting with those symptoms. Um, and so it's very important um, to know that if it's affecting your quality of life, that you really should be discussing this with your medical team. Um, pay attention to what's happening with those hot flashes. Um, it's really important to figure out what are my triggers, you know, for some people, um, it might be, you know, coffee or wine chocolate. I have a friend that swears potato chips is what is the trigger for her. So that greasy saltiness. Um, so really um, pay attention, do a little um, assessment when they're coming on. What are you doing? Try to avoid them when possible. If wine is your trigger, you know, you're going to pay attention, right? And you're going to say, well, I need my glass of wine tonight, or I'm having a social Zoom meeting as we're doing these days. Um, you know, I know I'm going to hot flash and I might have a rough night as a result, but I'm going to just go with the flow. Um, so it's really important to just kind of figure out what's going on. Laurie, I have just, to, yeah. Oh, sorry, Laurie, just a question, a couple of questions from our audience. Um, yeah. Was somebody you mentioned about the the woman that was having hot flashes in her eighties, <laughs> but how long on average does menopause last, in, including the symptoms that a lot of people experience? Is that is that hard to to find an average, or how long should um, we expect? Some of the data suggests it could be uh, as long as up to twenty years, but more commonly, it's um, you know down in that. Um, you know, first few years after you finish your, your menstrual cycles. Yeah. Okay. And then somebody else wrote um, in the, in the QA that there was uh, no, um, no symptoms, um, although they fin went through menopause five years before their gynae cancer diagnosis, and they never had any um, significant system or, or symptoms and after their hysterectomy as well. Is that normal for somebody not to have any yeah. symptoms? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do know a few people in my life that, um, and patients who've not had significant hot flashes. Um, sometimes in the breast cancer world, we do see someone that maybe didn't have any menopausal symptoms when they were going through the change, but because of some of the treatments we give or, or use, uh, they may find that they do have a little bit of hot flashes, vaginal dryness and those things. So 
Um, you know, sometimes it's a, a hit and a miss as far as who we can predict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes we look back at, um, you know, what our mothers went through, what was their natural age of menopause, how did they have hot flashes or manage those things. Um, and sometimes you can see kind of similar patterns, um, but it, it, it's very individualized. And as Lori pointed out to Kathleen, a lot of lifestyle things will contribute to hot flashes. So if you're somebody that doesn't um, exercise or depending on the clothing you're wearing, um, what you eat and drink, that can make things even worse at times. And we'll talk more about that as well throughout the session. For sure. Um, women that are taking the anti-hormonal therapy that I just alluded to, so that's tamoxifen and nastrozole, uh, letrozole and exemestine. Oh, no, go back, Michelle. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so they may find that the hot flashes and other menopausal symptoms are more intense. I often will recommend that you take them in the morning to keep them away from bedtime so that you're not kind of having that domino effect of increasing hot flashes, decreasing sleep, etc. cetera. Um, and there's different uh, versions of those drugs. So if you're, anybody's having any issues with their um, cancer therapy that we're giving you to suppress hormones, give me a shout and I can help specifically troubleshoot with you um, because again, that's very important to address. Dressing in layers, breathable fabrics, cottons, those types of things so that you can peel off layers when you're hot and put them back on when you're cool. We also have a lot of patients that talk about the types of sheets you use on your bed. Those nice high um, thread count sheets sometimes can kind of make you in like a little sauna in there. And so some people might use a nice uh, fabric on the bottom, but use a, a cooler or more breathable top sheet um, mm -hmm. as a way to do that. We do have a, a question about hot flashes at night and uh, waking you up. Somebody's experiencing that, like waking up repeatedly and yeah. then getting very cold and shivery after going through their, their, their hot flash. Any other suggestions that you've heard of besides yeah. the, the sheets and the... The sheets, a fan. Some people like the fan to try and um, keep the, the air circulating and moving. Some people will keep a, a cold cloth and a baggie beside the bed to kind of towel down. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of ladies that have to get up and change their nightgown um, as a result of just being soaked and then their children can't warm up. Um, you know, ice packs or different things on the back of your neck or on your wrist sometimes can help with the, the hotness. And if you can decrease the hotness, hopefully there'd be less chills, right? Yeah. Um, and again, looking to see what medications you're taking at bedtime. Um, and, um, and if it is a cancer medication for um, breast cancer specifically, weaning that back to earlier in the day, slow and steady, can help because again, if we take it away from the bedtime, maybe they'll be less intense. Um, and caffeine, alcohol, stress, all of those types of things certainly um, can increase um, hot flashes uh, as well. So again, in moderation and trying to keep yourself well and um, moving along. Okay. Michelle? So we'll go to the next slide. Switching. I'm trying oh, to get switch. Oh, it did switch? Okay, sorry. Oh, mine had. Oh, now you went back again. Sorry, it's glitching here. I apologize. That's okay. So, um, you know, we often will suggest um, lifestyle modifications, right? Decreasing the, the food triggers, being active, mindfulness, um, exercise, and all of those types of things. But sometimes those menopausal symptoms um, are significant and they're impacting your quality of life. You know, it's kind of hard to go through your day if you're having to stop and deal with a hot flash one or two times an hour. And for some ladies, it can be quite, quite disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, and while everybody goes through it, it just seems to add one more magnification spotlight on you and people are very mm -hmm. uncomfortable with it. So often um, we talk, you know, suggest talking to your team, talking to your family doctor about 
what can I do? These medications are really, really important, and especially in the breast cancer world, to be taken for your breast cancer. But if they're making your menopause symptoms worse, um, then it's important. And even with the gyne ladies, you know, some ladies might have the option of using hormone replacement therapy, but they may, may not want to be using a hormone. So maybe they're looking for non hormonal ways. So it's very important to kind of have that conversation with your doctor about what your options are. We very much will use a drug called venlafaxine um, or Effexor is the other name for it. And that is classed as an antidepressant, but it works quite nicely, not only for hot flashes, but it also helps to improve sleep and helps there in turn your mood. So it's kind of a, a good bang for your buck, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word. Laurie, just a question regarding medications, um, and I'm not sure if I will pronounce this right. Does omem, omeprazole increase hot flash rates? Are you familiar with that medication? I might be misreading it. Is that for like the stomach reflux? Yeah, it's yeah, a I, PPI. Yeah, it I shouldn't, don't think so. It should not increase your hot flashes, but sometimes people are on treatment and they're having reflux. So we start a map result. So it could be treatment and other factor related. Okay. And, and also another question about do, um, do hormone, does hormone therapy due to breast cancer, do the symptoms typically level out or reduce after a while? And how long does that take if, if they are having menopause symptoms and they're taking medication? Absolutely. Um, usually we say a good three to six months, people should have their symptoms settling down as your body's getting used to it. Um, you know, some people are just very sensitive to medications. Um, so often I'll work with the lady to uh, see what brand she's taking. We can change brands through the pharmacy because different um, generic versions of the medications um, are you know, tolerated better than others. So we can work with the pharmacist to try ordering in a new brand. Uh, some women have to change the drug itself to a different type of hormone blocking medication. So um, you know, in those situations, I would definitely encourage people to call me and let's have a chat about that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Another medication we use is called clonidine. And it's a blood pressure medication. With hot flashes, you've got that vasomotor uh, flushing. And so we certainly do see uh, some benefit there. Um, I talked about hormone uh, replacement therapy, and again, not for breast cancer. There are natural products and supplements out there. Um, but again, um, you know, you have to be careful and uh, vigilant at checking to make sure there's no hormonal uh, component to those if you've had uh, breast cancer. We have Cancer Care Manitoba pharmacists who can look up any natural products that you're using and chances are if they're helping with your hot flashes they probably have some hormonal component to them and we wouldn't recommend it. Okay a couple questions regarding uh, tamoxifen. Um, somebody mentioned that they've been missing their period or will they be continuing to miss their period as long as they're taking tamoxifen? So um, if you had chemotherapy and your period stopped, tamoxifen might slow down that return of your period, but it might come back on, on tamoxifen. This person, um, I think, has been on for five years. They've been on, on tamoxifen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So no, I would not expect um, tamoxifen um, to stop your periods. What tamoxifen does is it finds any estrogen receptors on your cells if this is kind of those receptors and this is a cell, tamoxifen just parks on them so that your hormones can't attach to the cell. So um, it technically doesn't stop your periods, um, mm -hmm. but it can mess them up, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. of the, the fluctuating hormone levels, we're trying to suppress the hormones. Some women find that their periods don't stop. At the five-year mark, sometimes we're changing medications to an aromatase inhibitor. And sometimes when we stop the tamoxifen to do that, sometimes the period might kind of come back at the stopping of the tamoxifen. Okay. Um, what if, and what about weight gain relating to tamoxifen? Somebody mentioned that they're having difficulty losing any weight, even with exercise and intermittent fasting. Um, 
that they are still, they feel that they are still experiencing a weight gain? There's a whole bunch of, you know, um, thoughts around that. I mean, definitely that lack of estrogen, um, people find that they can gain a bit of weight. Um, sometimes, um, you know, if, if their sleep is mucked up, if your sleep is mucked up, that could make it harder to lose weight. Um, your metabolism is different. Um, and that sleep wake, um, issue that comes up, um, can contribute to weight gain or the inability to lose weight. Um, exercise, eating well, limiting alcohol, those lifestyle pieces are very important. Um, and if someone is, um, you know, someone that started, um, you know, had that healthy lifestyle before their cancer diagnosis and treatment, they have those healthy uh, built-in mechanisms, right? So when they get back on track on that, sometimes they'll see that weight shift uh, to, to the better. Um, people that maybe weren't as uh, active or not eating quite as well before their diagnosis, um, you know, and, and a lot of people um, are comfort eaters. So some people find that they gain weight during the treatment and afterwards um, on tamoxifen or something like that, they may find that that weight is harder to come off. So, um, you know, we, that's, we get people connected with the dietitians. We have exercise programs. Sometimes it's just kind of doing all those little checks of, you know, what's your sleep doing, what's your mood doing, all of those types of things as a holistic approach. Thanks, Lori. Next slide. Now, is that me or you? That is me. <laughs> <Yeah. Thank> you. <laughs> Definitely I thought, me. I thought you were asking <laughs> about the picture. <laughs> um, anxiety and depression uh, symptoms um, definitely can contribute um, to sleep issues, uh, lack of estrogen, um, hot flashes, and those types of things can muck up your sleep. So it's kind of that which one comes first. There's a whole bunch of different things there. Um, and we certainly see that, you know, people who didn't have any anxiety, depression, um, through a cancer diagnosis, it's very common to have a little bit of that creep up. Um, some may get that more than others. And that's always a good place where we bring in psychosocial oncology, the counselors, um, to talk through some of that, um, that mood change. Um, definitely the lack of estrogen can play a part of that. Adding more medications to suppress hormones can also add that. So it's really important to learn some coping strategies, uh, relaxation techniques, uh, visual imagery, meditation, music, um, getting that counseling support can be helpful, uh, you know, and really trying to, um, balance kind of that stress response mm -hmm. you know we, we all get very testy and um emotional when we're sleep deprived or when we're stressed and sometimes with that menopause stuff it just um kind of takes it to one more level of extremeness um people that have had a history of anxiety and depression before cancer tend to find that those can bubble up on them as well and they may find that it's worse um, initially. So again, doing that self-assessment, checking in with yourself um, and talking to your team about that is very, very important. Um, and, you know, again, some people may need some medication, but, you know, we often will try that exercise approach, the mindfulness approach. There's some really great apps out there um, that you can download on your phone for free that can really help you track symptoms to kind of um, focus on some of that intentional breathing exercises and those types of things as well. Okay. Next slide. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I clicked it. It's. Mm -hmm. Let me see it. Okay. Got it there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So I love this picture. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, it's, it's important um, to be active. 
we know that when you're active, you're, um, you know, you're getting the, uh, the good endorphins, which can help your mood. Um, it can help with some of the stiffness and achiness that some, some women do experience related to menopause. Um, setting a plan and making a priority, um, you know, scheduling it in so that you are getting it done. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a 30 minute um, set time if you're just starting out and you're kind of just getting back on your feet. 10 or 15 minutes a couple of times a day is a great way to start and slowly build up from there. You know, whether it's a short walk, some people like doing stairs, dancing to music. We've been getting kind of creative with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to do something that you like. I know that um, Michelle's going to continue talking about some of these menopause symptoms, but uh, there's just a couple of questions. Um, one was related again to uh, medication. This one was letrozole. Yep. Um, noticing that they're having uh, joint pain or joint stiffness that's getting worse. And that might, I don't know, would exercise help that? Absolutely. Was- Absolutely. One of the things with those medications is that it kind of feels like a, a gelling or a stiffness in the muscles and the joints. And some people, whether it's getting up from the night of sleep or after sitting in a chair, they're kind of like creak, 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 and they're slowly trying to get um, the joints moving again. Um, and that's pretty common. And the main uh, characteristic that I see with women in that uh, experience find that once they get up and get moving, it kind of moves up the joints and, and things uh, carry on. Some women do have some, you know, aches and pains, uh, wrist pains, um, those types of things. That's kind of common. But definitely physical activity is a huge component to helping that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, again, Lori. One of the things that I typically will say is, again, if you're on those medications to call me because I can do a more in-depth assessment um, and we can talk specifically about what's going on for you. Great. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, Michelle, I I guess you're continuing here talking about sleep. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I love this slide as Lori was saying, well, we have a few of our favorite slides, the non-sleeping beauty (laughs) Um, really next to hot flashes, sleep issues are the other hallmark of menopause. So the second most common thing, um, what people usually find is they have difficulty falling asleep or they have difficulty staying asleep. Um, Lori's went over a lot of sleep tips and that kind of thing, um, already. So I won't repeat those types of things. Um, do be aware too, we did a webinar on sleep as well that we will be posting to the website in the future. But just following up on some of the things that Lori mentioned, um, when you're looking at sleep, there can be several variables that can be contributing to sleep issues. Of course, we talked through hot flashes, but also a bit more about your sleep environment. Is your bedroom nice and dark? Is it quiet? Um, is it a relaxing, relaxing space? Are you making sure you're not napping during the day? Sometimes we get used to that longer nap during the day. It might be time to start cutting it back and straightening things out that way. Um, Try to have meals a bit earlier, um, around five, six o'clock. Sometimes people that are eating later affects their sleep patterns and things like that. If you're somebody that finds you're waking in the night, so you get asleep and you wake in the night, Sometimes it's thoughts and worries and things like that that are keeping you awake. If it's hot flashes, try some of the tips that Lori talked about. Um, But if things are ongoing, absolutely reach out to us. Sometimes it's the case where people need to go on some kind of short-term sleep medication. Um, So there's lots of different things that can help or contribute to it. Often many people adding in exercise more specifically in the form of yoga can be helpful. Yoga helps with stress, stress reduction, helps with joint movement, strength, etc. And research actually supports yoga specifically as a great form of exercise with menopause. So keep that in mind. Um, If you're still having difficulties, like I said, reach out. Things usually within the first few months after treatment start leveling out. 
But if you're having a lot of menopausal symptoms or symptoms related to the medications you're now prescribed, please let us know. One of the other um, symptoms that we often hear from women about is about vaginal dryness. When we look at pictures of the female anatomy, it makes it look like the vagina is this long hollow tube, when in fact the vaginal walls are more, so to speak, touching or touching together. In menopause, the loss of estrogen on the body causes a thinning to this lining of the vagina. Um, when we look at a premenopausal vagina, the vagina actually has stretch and give as well. It's more, so to speak, like an accordion. So it's got folds in it that has stretch and movement. When we start thinning the tissue by taking away the estrogen, um, those tend to be less stretch and give. For women that receive pelvic radiation, there's even less stretch and give. So people often find vaginal dryness one of the most bothersome menopause related symptoms. When we talk about vaginal dryness, um, we know that there's different things that can be helpful for that. Um, having sex regularly, as much as women kind of roll their eyes at this, having sex regularly actually helps increase the blood flow to the vagina and naturally helps, so to speak, moisturize and keep that tissue in shape. So we do recommend having sex a few times a week um, as something that can be helpful. Some people will find that the area outside the vagina, so the area that we call the vulva, um, that area sometimes can have itch or burning. For some people, even with urination, even just sitting, walking, that kind of thing, it can be bothersome. So do know that things like moisturizers can be used to help keep that tissue healthy. I just want to differentiate moisturizers to lubricants. Moisturizers are similar to what I compare to most women as chapstick. So I'll put chapstick on to keep my lips from being dry, they'll keep moist, they'll feel more comfortable. That is what a moisturizer does to the vagina. So the vaginal walls with this type of medication, and again, it's over the counter or sometimes prescribed medication that's inserted into the vagina. And we usually do this three to four times a week to start with right at bedtime, actually is absorbed by the vaginal walls and allows them to pump up and get healthy. We do it at bedtime because you tend to have more discharge at first. So this way you're going to bed, it's absorbed, you have less discharge up the next day, etc. When we look at moisturizers, you often can decrease their use to a couple times a week as that tissue is able to hold in the moisture. All right. Um, for some women in breast cancer world, again, um, we do not want them using any type of moisturizer that has a hormone in it. For women that are in the gynecological world that may have, even at times in gyne cancer world, a hormone positive cancer, sometimes we will still say, yes, let's use the vaginal moisturizer with a local estrogen. So there's all sorts of different forms and options available. And again, that's in conversation with myself, your gyne oncologist or your gynecologist. All right, so it is something that can really, really help. The reason why also sometimes we focus on the vagina and we think, okay, when we're looking at this, we're talking about um, penetrative intercourse. Not always the case when you're having your physical exams done. Um, some people have them done on a uh, bi-monthly basis. Some people will have a pap smear that's due every three years. So depending what your health history is, it can make the exams uncomfortable if the area is really dry. So please, please, if you're having issues, there's lots of really good products out there um, and di varying degrees. So please talk to us. When we look at lubricants, lubricants are the slip and slide. So lubricants are what you use to coat the outside of the labia and anything entering into the vagina. Okay. So whether it be a dilator, whether it be a vibrator, whether it be a penis, et cetera. You want the slip and slide so that intercourse can be comfortable, all right? Once you're through menopause, your body's no longer making these or, or producing these at the same rate. Most women that are on tamoxifen find that they, it's not uncommon to have more vaginal moisture than what they've had in the past. 
If that's the case for you, great. If not, then this is something that can be helpful. We often recommend to people using a water-based type of lubricant. Um, the reason why we say water-based is if the tissue is irritated or upset at all, adding in things with heat or scents and that type of thing can add in irritation. So start out with a water-based lubricant. If you have no issue, go ahead and try some, you know, fancy things that seem interesting to you, no harm, but do at first start with your basic water-based lubricant and experiment from there. I highly encourage you um, to go into your local sex shop, talk to them, say, you know, what kind of products are available? This is my history. They're very, very helpful and they're very professional to people. Um, some people choose to buy things online. Some people just wanna go with the regular drugstore type brand of thing. But, but don't be embarrassed, don't be shy. So many of our women say to us how helpful it's been to go to a shop and talk to somebody because they're usually are people that are having difficulties or questions. And again, they're very helpful. One of the, the confounding things that can be um, between childbirth as well as as we age and that loss of estrogen is a change to our bladder control. When you're looking at the diaphragm, the diagram, you can see there that there's muscles that go over the base of the pelvic floor. The reason why we have those muscles or those muscles are what contract and relax to let urine and stool through. When we're looking at um, treatment, we know that treatment um, in the form of radiation, surgery, as well as when we're looking at some of the anti-hormone things all affect those hormone levels. When we lose our estrogen, those muscles get lazy or so to speak, lax, all right? So it's not uncommon for people to have to perform Kegel exercises after having treatment of some sort. For some women that Lori has met with in the past, they've noticed changes with, that have had reconstruction with the tummy use. Um, so there can be several combining factors that can upset, so to speak, what has been your, your usual or your norm. Um, the good news is Kegel exercises can help. Do be cautious though. It's really important to know that some women actually need to or need to consider pelvic floor physiotherapy. Pelvic floor physiotherapy is a form of physiotherapy that's invasive into the vagina. And the physiotherapist works with you to um, strengthen some muscles as well. Some muscles may be over tense or heightened and learn how to relax them as well. Again, scar tissue, having reconstruction surgery with breast cancer, et cetera, can all, so to speak, upset and tilt this away from what your norm is. And there's some really great pelvic floor physiotherapists here in Winnipeg. I believe Dr. Katz um, mm -hmm. went over pelvic floor physio a bit at her presentation. Um, but again, it's kind of retraining those muscles. Kegels can work well for some people, but it's kind of like if I hurt my bicep, if I'm doing bicep curl, sometimes that does more damage, right? So if you're finding you have issues, please, please reach out. When we look at pelvic floor physiotherapy, you want to have someone who's specifically trained in pelvic floor physio. It's not just an everyday physiotherapist type of treatment. Lori talked some already about weight gain. Um, all of us, as we head into menopause, will notice changes to, you know, often to our waistline or to the hips, kind of thigh area. It can be a challenge when we actually go through menopause pause. Um, it's, it's periods of perimenopause, women gain about four and a half pounds during that period on average. And that's even right before menopause is in full swing. We, we know is not directly related to menopause, but it's often like Lori said, that loss of sleep, change in metabolism, changes to our body um, that can be really challenging. Do focus on yourself, your health, your wellness. It's really important. We know that when we're looking at research that says chances of cancer reoccurrence, we know obesity, weight gain, those kinds of things are really, um, are really something that we need to pay attention to. Um, so do reach out, talk to the dietitians here at Cancer Care. Breast Health Center has a great dietitian there as well too. 
um, following Canada's food guide, focusing on the fact of, you know, what does my plate look like? How much of my plate is vegetables, et cetera. And activity. Um, I think we've talked a great deal about exercise and those kinds of things. Again, looking at things like swimming and cycling, if you have a lot of that joint pain, those may be things that are really um, of benefit to you. And often the more you move, the better those joints and that type of thing feel as well. Um, but also reward yourself, right? We sometimes set goals so high that it's, we forget to celebrate those steps we make towards that larger goal. So do many steps of, you know, when I lose five pounds, I'm going to treat myself. Maybe I'm going to go get a manicure. Maybe I'm going to go get a haircut, whatever, but do things to celebrate um, and treat yourself for your accomplishments. Thank you, Michelle. I know that um, Lori's going to talk about some of the other health or risks associated um, with menopause, but I do have some questions. I just were relating a little bit again to medication. Somebody else had asked a question about um, they had after treatment was done, it was breast cancer. They uh, had a medical menopause with Zoladex. Mm -hmm. Is that saying that right? And they've developed rashes that don't go away even with uh, steroid cream. Any thoughts on that? Or have you heard of that happening? I haven't heard of that. Uh, have you discussed it? What I suggest would be, first of all, to discuss with their oncologist or the doctor prescribing the Zolodex. Mm -hmm. um, because in my years of experience, I haven't seen people get that type of rash. And I see Lori shaking her head as well, too. Mm -hmm. So that would be unusual um, mm -hmm. and definitely something worth having investigation to. And maybe in the end, they need a referral to a dermatologist or someone. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and then just to clarify a couple other questions, just wanting clarification, does hormone replacement reduce symptoms of menopause? Does it make a difference? So when we look at hormone replacement therapy in the gynecological cancer treatment world, we in general, and this is a generality, recommend hormone replacement therapy up to the natural age of menopause to reduce the risks associated with menopause. And Lori's going to talk about those in a few mm -hmm. minutes. But also we recommend it to manage menopause. And sometimes it's the case where it's a hormone replacement people are taking orally, sometimes topically, sometimes it's things that we put into the vagina. So there's an array of things, but we're doing it and adjusting dosages to manage menopause. Okay. And another question, is there a difference between the symptoms and side effects you might have between letrazole, eczemus, ex, sorry, eczemus stain? Yeah. Yeah. And anastosol. Anastrozole. Yeah. Anastrozole. Pardon me. Um, okay. Yeah. Somebody that would, I guess, is wondering what they will need to move on to after tamoxifen. Can, can I make a suggestion? Because we're heading into our last eight sure. minutes of the presentation. Um, could people contact Lori or I with questions that they haven't had a chance to review, et cetera? Um, because mm -hmm. we still have about six more slides yeah. to go. Um, just as a time limitation. Yes, for sure. Let's do that. Go ahead, uh, Lori. Yeah. And I, when, um, if you call me, I can check out your chart and we can talk specifically about your situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I get lots of calls about those drugs. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I just want to, yeah, for sure. Um, I just wanted to highlight brain fog. Um, brain fog is, is, we used to call it chemo brain, but now we know it's more than just chemo brain. Women that um, don't have chemo still end up with some sort of a brain fog. Up to 75% of women um, and men that are going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment do experience some sort of brain fog. Um, and that could be for a multitude of reasons and menopause is part of that. Um, most people find that the symptoms will improve um, within the first two years after their treatments are finished. But also having said that, um, we still do know that, you know, that hot flashes, disrupted sleep um, are ongoing issues with menopause. And so if we can try and improve those types of things, often you see the brain fog aspect of things improving. Um, and we do have a brain fog class at Cancer Care. 
Um, and it's an eight week session. You meet one in an hour, one and a half hours a week. Um, and we just kind of try to fast track some of that recovery. So brain fog might be things like uh, forgetfulness, forgetting uh, appointments, losing keys, not being able to multitask. And we have all experienced that when we didn't have a good sleep the night before, or we're not feeling the greatest. So um, people with uh, cancer and cancer treatments find that because they're having lots of symptoms and issues, it tends to be more significant. Um, and so there's lots of things. We've got a little resource that we have in our library that we can also send out to people. Um, and it depends too on where you started prior to cancer treatment and where you've ended up. Do you want to hit enter again? Um, and for some people, um, oops, there oh, we go. Some of us didn't start out so good. Um, but we do know that with time and work, um, usually things can improve uh, slow and steadily. Next slide. So I'm just going to focus on some of the um, health risks related to um, menopause. Because of that lack of estrogen, we do know that you can have um, bone loss develop as a result of that low estrogen. And that can start slowly developing as you're transitioning into menopause. Low bone density can increase the risk for fractures or broken bones. Um, and osteoporosis is kind of that end result. So, um, you know, when bones are starting to thin, it's called osteopenia. And then when the bones are thin and at risk, that's what osteoporosis is. So we do recommend um, making sure you're getting enough calcium. For pre or perimenopausal women, um, the recommendation is about 1200 milligrams a day, or sorry, 1000 milligrams a day. For postmenopausal women, it's 1200 milligrams a day. And you really should be aiming to get as much as you can through diet and topping up with the supplements to get to your required amount. With vitamin D, that helps the calcium absorb into the bones. And we know that um, 800 to 2000 is uh, international units a day is harder to get through your diet. And with our climate, it's often recommended to supplement not smoking, because um, smoking also affects bone density. Um, women that are taking those uh, aromatase inhibitors um, are usually recommended to have a bone density test as a baseline and then watching uh, the results every few years. And exercise is also very important, especially weight bearing exercises that kind of um, jarring of the bones helps to build bone mass. Swimmers are fit, but they don't have good bone mass um, when that's all they do. So you need that weight bearing. Next slide. And heart disease. Because of that lack of estrogen, we do, um, do know that you're at an increased risk for heart disease. And heart disease meaning uh, blood pressure, cholesterol. And so those things uh, for any woman uh, that's postmenopausal should be monitored. And again, together with your family doctor, um, you know, treating if it's elevated. Um, often they'll look at lifestyle, exercise, diet, and those types of things and smoking, but also um, not allowing that to go on too long. So that's heart disease. And then there's just a few information uh, contacts. Again, if you're needing some help, talk to your oncologist or your family doctor. You can call Michelle or I. Um, we do have gynecologists that specialize in menopause that work a lot with our cancer patients um, and also the counseling department as well. It's very important to, um, to know that there's support out there specifically for you. Okay, thank you, Lori. Um, just we have time for just a couple more comments. Um, somebody mentioned uh, just for the discussion on night sweats that they bought a pair of PJs from a company called Cool Jams. So designed to be extra wicking at night to keep you cool. And then somebody else had also mentioned that they felt that they experienced more chills than um, sweats. Is that a possibility that you would have chills as opposed to hot flashes? Is that a symptom of menopause? It could be, yep. 
I would also question to make sure that the thyroid levels are checked as well. Okay. Sometimes okay. those hormone fluctuations in that um, avenue can, um, you know, affect hormones. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so it looks like that that's all our questions that we had. And thank you very much to Lori and Michelle for sharing all your knowledge and, and answering the questions about menopause. It seems like it's quite a, a complex uh, thing that all of us go through more complex than maybe people are acknowledged, but it's, there's a lot of things involved. And I thank you for sharing your wealth of information. Thank you to all our guests for their questions. And um, we'll leave it there and have a great day, everyone. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye.